Well, uh, hopefully everybody got something to eat, uh, had a sugar cookie to keep you awake. Uh, if not, John will do that. Uh, I think we'll be just fine. Uh, so uh, as was mentioned, my name is Michael Teicher, and I'm the Chief Revenue Officer of Scripps Networks. Uh, and despite provocations of the opposite, linear television is not dead, uh, and it will be here for a long time. That will last my career, and I think all of yours. Uh, the Scripps Networks is comprised of free, over-the-air television for networks like ION, Bounce, which is an AA-targeted network, Laugh, Core TV, and probably other brands that you've heard of. And we serve the community that purchases small, inexpensive digital antennas. So as I mentioned, free over-the-air television. So we cater to those who are cord cutters and cord nevers. So we have a unique place in the media landscape because we uh, have this ability to provide unique reach to national advertisers uh, between those who view free over-the-air television uh, and also are heavy viewers of streaming. So that seems to be our place in the uh, media, media ecosystem. So uh, I had to put in a little plug for linear television. But we do have a CTV portfolio as well. So, um, but thank you very much for coming today. Um, and I realize that many of you saw John in the last panel. So we, our questions will be a lot different. Or if there are similarities, we'll take them down a different path. Uh, the other thing I'd like to encourage that after we get into this a little bit, uh, don't hesitate. If you want to ask a question during our session, it won't ruin my cadence. I don't think it'll bother any of us. So please feel free to do so. Like uh, literally raise your hand, ask a question. Interrupt me, interrupt Michael. No We problem. understand like we've just had lunch. Everybody's getting back into the afternoon. So right. we want to make this as interactive and as joyful for everybody that's here. And John and I go way back. So I mean, I think since last Thursday. So we know each other really well. I got to uh, tell you, I've actually learned a lot from you in the last seven days, like what the heck a digital antenna is. Oh, well, that's good. So and we, like the power of what it offers people today. Okay. I'll, I'll bet you there's a few young people in here who actually know what a digital antenna is because they all like something free. So uh, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, so, well, this is terrific. So instead of asking you to tell us about the jobs you've had, because I think a lot of people have heard that, uh, I think it would be valuable to really take a look at what may, you may have taken from each of those jobs and how that helped really shape where you are today to get to that C-suite. Yeah, the, um, I'll, I'll try to frame that in a few different areas. I, I think I mentioned it in the earlier session. Mattel for me was end-to-end -end thinking, just the ability to understand all of the different dynamics that go on in business. Uh, one of the most interesting moments that I had, and for those of you that know LA pretty well, the Mattel offices are in El Segundo. They've got beautiful views that overlook the Pacific Ocean. It wasn't so beautiful back in 2003 or four when the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of San Pedro decided to have a strike. And they decided to have a strike when all of the goods and services to be able to take care of Christmas and make sure all of those gifts were under the tree for children around the world were literally hanging out in boats on the Pacific Ocean. And you could see from my office, dozens of boats just sitting out there. <laughs> and then the reality of, oh my gosh, how are we actually gonna deliver against our revenue expectations as a publicly traded company? How are we actually gonna deliver on the expectations that families have, children have, of having those goods and services available to them? And then trying to figure out how are we gonna solve that problem? was just for me a moment realizing how important it is to have end-to-end -end thinking and figure out contingency plans and ways in which you can solve problems out there. Literally down to the point of like, I can't direct the boat to the port because the port's on a strike right now, but what contingencies we can put in place like fly the goods over, find other ports to be able to bring the products and services in. And if you don't have that kind of end-to-end -end thinking, you're not gonna learn how to be able to think creatively when disruptions like that occur. And I've held on to that principle because in a world today, and we talked about it previous, and most of the sessions today have had this, this is a disruptive environment we're in. And if you've got experiences from your past where you've learned through that disruption, you've learned how to be successful through that disruption, it's going to make you and serve you much better. Because if there's anything that I think all of us recognize right now, change is going to continue. Volatility for us is going to continue. So figuring out how to work through that is really important. 
um, the EA days, the power of entertainment. I mean, there's, there's nothing more amazing than watching grown men, grown women completely lose their mind in a video game. <laughs> and, and, and not only like against their friends, but to lose in games against their children, against their own significant others, and just the power of, of the kind of experiences and the kind of entertainment you can bring in your work and in your craft is something I'll never forget because at the end of the day, whether you're a small startup trying to solve a customer problem or you're the size of a large Fortune 100 company trying to solve a problem, if you deliver a great experience for your end customer, you're solving a problem for someone and you're making someone's life better because of that. And I got the chance to see that happen, certainly at scale and the power of what gaming can do to families and individuals from that experience standpoint. Um, well, and even just the explosion in that category today is still astronomical between completely. live events, television events, uh, and you mentioned women, uh, even casual gaming. We know that I, I think it's more than 50% of casual gaming online is done by women now. That's right. And that's pre-Wordle. That's right, pre-Wordle, yes. <laughs> uh, the um, other learnings, you know, when I was at Yahoo, I think one of the really powerful things we did was we sort of cr tried to find our own disruptions in a market in which we were being disrupted. Yahoo had be been the leader for so many years, became the challenger in the world of Google and in the world of Facebook. Mm -hmm. How could we find ways to disrupt back? By working closely with many people in that organization, who, including Lisa Lich, who I mentioned earlier, we created a brand new partnership with Live Nation, where we created a live streamed concert every day of the year. And this included live streaming Lady Gaga out of Paris, Justin Timberlake out of Iceland, mm -hmm. uh, Dave Matthews, Aerosmith, Prince before he passed. And it was our way of taking our platform, but disrupting back in a unique and different way that allowed us to all of a sudden become a part of the conversation again, become a brand that actually younger audiences had sort of written us off for mm -hmm. and bring us back into an opportunity for them to actually consider us. Um, and that was a really important learning of taking something that you have on your platform, finding really good partners, disrupting back where you have been disrupted to all of a sudden change the conversation. Well, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And interestingly, uh, earlier in the week, for those of you who may have attended on Monday, uh, the CMO of Converse, and I'm going to paraphrase for a second, basically said, if you're a brand who is afraid to disrupt, you will be disrupted. So even though we haven't gotten into really the legal Zoom conversation, I would just love to hear from you philosophically yeah. uh, where your risk tolerance is and how you weigh and measure and balance that against performance standards versus taking some risk to grow the business. It's a really good question. Um, my risk tolerance, I would say, is really high. Uh, but what I would say is it's not without feeling confident that the risks we're taking aren't backed by strong data, strong insights that give me confidence that the risks we're taking have a higher percentage of succeeding than not. Mm -hmm. And so it's, if I would describe it maybe different in that I'm one that loves to take risks as long as the risks are calculated. Uh, the insights are, educa are educational and insightful for us to feel like at the end of the day, we're gonna win more than we're going to fail because we've actually done our homework, we've actually done our work, feel confident in taking those risks. And at the end of the day, still know that, at the, that there's only one failure in life and that's when you don't learn from something. And as long as you're willing to take those risks and at the end of the day, they know that some of those risks are gonna be not as successful as you think, but you, your team, the people that get to work on them every day, you give them that environment to feel like they can fail up or mm -hmm. they can take those risks to be able to learn and you give them the environment to experiment and learn there that at the end of the day even in those risks where maybe some of them didn't work out as long as there was a learning there there's a success there yeah. and to be able to lean into that and then bridge into the next initiative or the next idea that you have and so i would say that in our industry right now i think our our tolerance is 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 so strong uh to be able to to continue to try to disrupt a an industry that we disrupted many years ago, mm -hmm. uh, but do so through insight, experience, understanding, 
uh, that we're going to likely be successful or succeed more than we are not because we're, while taking risks, we're doing it in a very smart and educated way that we feel like we've got high confidence in succeeding. So everybody's mentioned it on all the panels, and, and we've certainly discussed it, that this is really a unprecedented time of complete tumult, whether it's through macroeconomic conditions, uh, geopolitical uh, challenges across the globe, and that's really impacting media and marketing in, in all forms. So you've been at LegalZoom now for nearly three years, and I, I imagine the last six months to a year have really manifested some really challenging times. How have you navigated through some of these challenges? And, and what are some of the strategies that you've tried to employ yeah. or uh, recommendations to others? You know, Michael, you, you frame that or question through the idea that there have been challenges. I actually don't necessarily see it that way. I see it more as the market has provided us an opportunity to adapt, to learn, and to find new opportunities in that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, if you think back about a year ago at this time, we had become a newly public company in the market. And we are now navigating being a still new, relatively new uh, company that is public in the market with an environment that's got a lot of change happening around it. And so what it has provided us is an opportunity to evaluate do we have the, pre the best products and services to cater our customers? Let's learn from what we have done in the past. Let's evaluate where we are today. And let's take advantage of those insights to build new products and services that are going to take care of our customers in ways that we haven't in the past. On the marketing side, we were, we enabled, we were enabled because of what was happening in the macro environment of the tailwinds and the businesses and everything else to really drive a significant amount of growth through our marketing efforts. Mm -hmm. We are now in an environment where the expectation is we need to look for that growth, but we need to look for that growth in a much more profitable manner and to be very smart and vigilant in the way that we manage that from a profitability standpoint. That's not a challenge for me. That's an opportunity to evaluate and learn how can we do things different. Mm -hmm. And it's been fascinating to watch my, our, my team and, and the members that I have within the team be able to adjust the way they think about things. Okay, you want to create guardrails that are no longer about necessarily significant revenue growth. Now we want to move it more to profit growth. Done. We can do that, and we can do that within a couple of weeks. We can do that in terms of changing guardrails from revenue growth on an LTV basis to profit growth on an LTV basis. And we're able to then identify being able to do that within certain channels and shifts our spends and shift our creative that allows us to actually pull those levers in an environment that's asking us to think about the definition of success a little bit differently than it did, let's say, a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, some might look at that as a challenge. For me, it's, it's, it, I would look at it more as it's created an opportunity for us to be able to learn a new muscle and learn how to flex in a different way in which we're going to be successful because we've actually built the infrastructure, built the team, and built talent that knows how to do that and knows how to do that well. So speaking of all the changes and, and the transitions that have taken place, the consumer journey, how they're ingesting or viewing content. I'm sure that's had a dramatic impact on your marketing and media mix modeling uh, since the time that you've been there because consumer behavior is changing so fast. Can you take us through a little bit of, of how that's manifested itself? Yeah. The, I'll try to build on not only that question, but also a little bit of that conversation earlier uh, with, with Andy and Katie. As I mentioned, when I arrived there, the business had primarily been a marketing organization that was driven through budget and then driven through budget primarily through three channels. So paid search, linear television, and terrestrial radio. And we had to build an infrastructure that allowed us to navigate into new channels that we knew were going to be quite successful for us once we stood up in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we needed to do was experiment and learn and illustrate confidence of shifting not only budgets out of certain channels, so like out of terrestrial radio, out of linear, not completely, mm -hmm. but into those new channels. Um, but then also do it in a way in which the budget was no longer the end result of how much we were spending. It was actually what is the performance you can actually return back to the business. Mm -hmm. And if that performance is in guardrails that we are comfortable with, whether that is a revenue target or a profit target, you are allowed to be able to continue to drive growth in the business with those guardrails in place. 
And that allowed us then to be able to grow our marketing investments, grow our marketing investments in channels that we had proven through experiments and through testing to be successful for us. Many of those became quite digital in nature. So your digital video, your OTT, your streaming, your digital audio. Mm -hmm. um, it also allowed us to get into paid social uh, in a much more significant way than we have had uh, previous. Um, in all of that, we've maintained a form of linear television. Uh, we have maintained a significant amount of spend in paid search, but their percentage of our overall mix has changed mm -hmm. while we've actually grown our marketing investments because other channels have actually proven to be more ROI positive for us relative to some of the other channels we used to be in. So when you think about that, and, and I think this will be a good segue to talk about your brand and brand versus performance, and I know you have a, a few new spots that you want to debut today, I believe. Uh, but well, here, here, Sorry, you know what's interesting? Watching some of the earlier uh, panels, we're here at a brand and marketing summit, and there's been like no creative shown, no assets shown. Like, this is why we're in this business, right? Create wonderful pieces of material and content to celebrate the work that we do every day from a products and services standpoint, and then find audiences that are going to connect with that. So if there's a question and an opportunity to sort of show a couple of pieces of creative, I thought, what a nice way to sort of bring it in and actually allow the audience to stop listening to us and maybe listen to Sam Richardson. Yeah, but I um, think just looking at stills of us is probably going to be more entertaining. I, I, I don't... Certainly, well, certainly you're. Well, you're, I mean, you're I'm, rocking I'm, the sure purple, I'm rocking the purple shirt there. So you know what? Why, why Yahoo don't we... would be proud, by the way. <laughs> Yahoo would be very proud. So actually, why don't we use looking at some of your creative as an entree to talk about brand versus performance and how you think about that and what channels you use for that. So I, I hope we have this queued up. This will be our first live performance for uh, seeing video. We do. So you want to... Okay, so now it's standing still. Do you want to give a little overview to this yeah. trailer of this movie? Yep. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the entire intention behind this new campaign was to really reinforce the fact that LegalZoom is in the business of small business. And so the association of the creative was make that very clear, that we are in the business for small business. And we brought a new agency with 72 and Sunny. We brought Sam Richardson in. And what we created were three 30-second different uh, mon or vignettes representing different archetypes of small businesses. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, this is Viva La Puppet, and it celebrates uh, individuals who have a craft, have a specialty, have a hobby that they want to make real, that they actually want to be able to sell something that they care so much about uh, in terms of a product or a service, whether that's through a retail shop or through an e-commerce site. And uh, the next spot you'll see is called It's Business Time, which is actually a montage of three different archetypes uh, illustrating the power of LegalZoom and our ability to be able to help support you as an entrepreneur in whatever endeavor you have uh, as a small business owner or aspiring to become a successful small business owner. So this first one is called uh, Viva La Puppet. The second one is called It's Business Time. Uh, they are on, there you go. It's time. You have an alarming number of puppets. Oh. I sell them online. Let's make this puppet biz legit. Do it. What the? Oh, you are good. Legal Zoom. Now you're in business. One of the insights uh, you'll see that Sam says in the spot, let's make this business legit is there are many businesses out there that get started but don't actually form. And there is a significant risk that gets associated with that as a small business owner if you're actually running a business that isn't compliant with a lot of rules and regulations that exist at the city level, the county level, the state level, and the government level. And so one of the insights that we tried to portray here is you may have a business that's up and running. You may have a business that you're actually you're being able to participate in something you care very much about but it's really important that you make it, you form it, you make it legitimate, so you actually are protected uh, in a way in which the compliance offerings that are necessary, uh, you're actually being taken care of. And so that's why that comment there about let's make this business legit was an important one because we wanted to make sure people understood you can have a business, but make sure you form it in the right way. We can help support that because at the end of the day, it actually protects you 
when you form your business uh, from a regulatory and, and regulations and compliance standpoint? Well, I, I can tell you, uh, and this is completely candid, I happen to be the owner of three LLCs, uh, one which is defunct, um, but the other two are alive and well. And so I have been a LegalZoom customer now since 2015. Uh, and I can tell you that I literally don't have to think about a thing. I get an email or I get a phone call uh, that says it's time to do your compliance work, which really means I'm not doing anything, that it has to be done, so LegalZoom is doing it. And I've been able to see the progression of the customer service. Uh, which has been terrific, so, and I appreciate that. So uh, tell us about the second spot. Second one is it's business time. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a montage of three different um, vignettes uh, or archetypes of different uh, customers. Uh, the two you'll see is, uh, the other, the two new ones that you'll see in here, uh, one is the, in, the world of professional and consulting services. So think about those that want to be consultants, real estate agents, travel agents, that world where you can do that now, obviously quite uh, digitally these days. And then the third is someone who wants to freelance. Uh, this became incredibly important from an insight standpoint, certainly during the pandemic and also during the great resignation mm -hmm. that a lot of people wanted to find a passion in a second form of income, uh, wanted to do something freelance, wanted to take something that was a hobby and turn it into something professional, but not maybe necessarily do it full time, but to be able to do it on their side as a, uh, a side hustle or as a second form of revenue uh, or income for them. And so the archetype here of both the second one and a third one are bringing in that passion or that insight that we learned uh, in, in just understanding the small business community. Right. See it. It's start your business time. Real estate is booming. I should be booming. It's business time. So, free yourself from this by going freelance. Get your thing started. I'm the boss of me! LegalZoom, now you're in business. One of the really fun um, learning from the last piece, uh, which is the freelance piece where we have um, our female uh, archetype uh, take off and she's going to be the boss of her. There's a fascinating trend going on in the business community right now uh, where for so many years there was the girl boss, the idea that women were going to rise to the top and be successful by being C-suite, by running businesses. And, and there's, been a, there's, been, there's a lot more work to do there, uh, but they've, it, it's been incredible to see the change and the power that's risen from that. We're now seeing a different kind of thing happen, particularly with, with, with uh, women-owned businesses where they're choosing to start their own business and walk away from that environment because they want to be their own boss. They want to actually have the flexibility to do the things that matter to them. Mm -hmm. And so one of the really neat insights of this particular piece was a larger trend, particularly with incredibly successful female executives, is their desire to actually have more freedom, have more flexibility to be their own boss. And so there's an insight there in that one that I think is really interesting that you don't necessarily see every day, but now you're actually starting to see it in the press where more and more women are saying, you know what, I want flexibility in my life. I want a different path for my life, whether it be for me personally, for my family, for my loved ones, for my friends, I'm gonna be my own boss. Uh, and I hope that that particular piece really does emotionally connect with that audience because it's an important one. Yeah, and, and clearly these are really strong brand building messages that you're applying. And, and obviously creative evolves over time, the messaging evolves over time. Certainly long before you got there, the creative was very different. But now, but now let's talk about that because let's talk about the funnel where you are engaging in brand advertising and certainly performance metrics. And we've heard from earlier pa panels that you know, the CEOs of some companies really want to understand you know, every day, what, what did that marketing do for us? So how do you balance that? And does that create some challenges uh, in the C-suite to discuss that? Opportunities in the C-suite, Michael. Uh, Opportunities. The, uh, the, um, yeah, the, it, it is, we've had to, the way that we, we structured a lot of our creative uh, and through our campaign and messaging framework was we have the Now You're in Business campaign, which really is the archetype of our brand effort. Uh, to be able to introduce the brand, drive that brand familiarity and that product familiarity, particularly around 
uh, small businesses and being in the business for small business. We have the MBA content, uh, which really is to be able to associate ourselves with a very important philanthropic and mission-driven uh, program that we launched with the MBA. And then there is a whole series of content that the creative team builds that's very traditional in performance marketing orientations. Uh, it is there to drive traffic, product sessions, and conversion through uh, our funnel. Mm -hmm. And we look and evaluate at those assets literally every day uh, and then formalize it every week in my own staff meetings, in uh, marketing reviews that we have. And not only are we looking at the engagement and the performance of each of those assets, but then we're also evaluating what performance are we finding within the channels that the spends are in. Mm -hmm. And in certain instances, we're finding that certain channels, digital audio, streaming, digital video, are far outweighing from an ROI standpoint, other channels. So we're gonna evaluate where we can put more investment there mm -hmm. with a best performing creative, update that creative if we need to, to because there's a certain message that we wanna hit harder and push heavy in there. If there are channels in which no matter what we spend there, even with our best creative, based on our insights and experience orientation, it's not performing, we're gonna dial it back. And the change that has occurred more recently is the importance of everything that I just described through guardrails and return expectations that are now a balance between revenue generation and profit generation. And, and I've had to then within the C-suite opportunities conversation is to be able to have to articulate we're investing in these certain channels, whether it's top, middle, or bottom, mm -hmm. because we are seeing these kind of performance returns that are bringing in the kind of qualified audience that we want. We're seeing that level of engagement, but the conversion is such that it is not only performant and driving growth, but it's also performant and driving profit. And in some instances, and we've had to make shifts. We've had to say, you know what? There are certain elements of, of brand advertising that we had in certain channels. Mm -hmm linear television being an example, where we're likely gonna have to pull that back because I'm not able to recognize that level of attribution and that level of clarity of performance where I can in other channels. And so we've taken those great assets, instead of saying, oh, we cannot use them, we've said, no, let's actually put those assets in other channels where that performance expectation is attributable and it is actually delivering against our guardrails. And as I mentioned earlier, most fascinating is the fact that some of our creative that was built for brand is actually converting better for us in a conversion period. And I think a lot of it has to do with cohorts and audiences today really caring about the values and mission of brands. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna convert and they're gonna engage with you if they believe in your mission, the same way they believe in their own values against something. So, uh, yeah, please. I know there's a few topics we still wanna get to, but I love the idea of a question. No yeah. problem. It is such an awesome question. And it's because for many businesses, and we are one of them, we, we leverage a media mix model that, that takes a lot of that attribution that you're talking about that still have cookies and still have pixels that allow us to understand that. At the same time, we're a business that needs to firm up and continue to further develop our own first party data. Andy talked earlier in his first fire, uh, fireside chat about the power of a CDP and a customer data platform. I fundamentally believe those pieces, those platforms are going to become essential in your ability to be able to reach the audiences that you're looking for, engage deeply with them, personalize that because you have data to be able to provide that kind of one-on-one -on -one personalization. But in an interesting world, I wonder if we're actually gonna go back to the old world sort of what is old is new again, yeah. where reach, frequency, larger targeted audiences through more sophisticated behaviors than old traditional linear television had 20 years ago, but a way in which you're gonna now have to balance a new media world where it's top of funnel brand building through very traditional sort of uh, metrics like reach, frequency, audience, leveraging then 
as much of your first party data to have more of a personalized experience for those audiences and then figure out in a new media world how those two pieces connect because the cookies used to help us do that. If we don't have that, then we as marketers and everyone in this room have to figure out ways we now solve that problem. Because one thing I will tell you, the CFO, the CEO, the COO, they're not gonna allow that to be an excuse. They're gonna expect us to figure out how to solve that problem. Otherwise, they'll solve it for us by reducing budgets. Well, I hate to say it, but we've actually been given the hook already. That was the first, the fastest 30 minutes I could ever remember. I'm glad we got your spots in. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, wh why Thank you for, well, I'm glad we got one question in. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't realize. It. Oh, wait a minute, there's another question, but I, I need permission. Now, one, one last question, and then I swear we'll call it a day. Wow, uh, absolutely, uh, on two fronts. One is on our products and services. What new products can we bring to market maybe faster because the necessity of those products that we thought we would need in market are now having to be accelerated? There is a lot of innovation going on in that space within our business. I wish I could tell you more, uh, but your, an, your question actually is very true in our world of looking at our products and services and saying, wow, we thought we needed this much time. We're actually, we want it now to be this much time because we actually see a need in the market that we need to accelerate our resources, our investment and our support to get those products and services out. So absolutely there, I wish I could be more specific, but you'll see that coming by virtue of exactly what you just said. We needed to accelerate those insights. And on the marketing side, absolutely. We knew at one point we would have to be able to balance revenue growth and profit growth and be really good at being able to evaluate the necessity of that balance through the levers that we had. I would, pres I would tell you I probably thought I had more time to be able to work through the attribution, the media mix, the financial connections of those pieces. The macro environment that we're all living in created a necessity for us to accelerate our ability to actually be able to do that. And I give my team all the credit in the world that they figured out a way to do that and do it quickly, that we are now every day involved in evaluating channels, spend, creative levers that allow us to balance revenue growth to profit growth in a way that's gonna be meaningful to our, for our ability to be able to continue to, to succeed in our business. Ladies and gentlemen, John Buchanan from LegalZoom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.